Hello and welcome to lecture number eight, where we're going to discuss work by Alfred Wallace and uh, Rosemary Varley and their colleagues. First, we're going to begin with a little bit of a review. Um, the reason why one posits recursion in the first place for language is to explain discrete infinity. And uh, obviously, the, uh, the set of natural numbers also exhibits this property. It, it also exhibits discrete infinity. Now, given that unbounded counting is not a biological adaptation, and given that discrete infinity is very rare in um, the organic world, it's reasonable as a conjecture to uh, suppose that unbounded counting is a side product of language. Now that was the argument prior to the work of Elizabeth Spipen and her colleagues, whom we discussed earlier. Uh, Spipen et al. adduced controlled evidence to the effect that language plays a crucial role in precise counting beyond four. But there's still something puzzling about the claim that unbounded counting is an offshoot of language. If it's true that other species have the computational component of language and they're using it in social cognition, then why don't those other species exhibit unbounded counting ability? I mean, after all, it's the computational component of language which explains unboundedness. It's the recursion which explains unboundedness. Now to address this issue, let's turn back the clock and look at the origins of this discussion. It was the biologist Alfred Russell Wallace, Russell with one L, that's how he spelled it. It was Alfred Russell Wallace who first noted that natural selection alone could not explain unbounded counting. In other words, unbounded counting is not a uh, Darwinian adaptation. Now, for some background on Wallace, um, Wallace actually arrived at the idea of natural selection as a means of um, explaining biological evolution. Wallace had this idea independently of Darwin. Uh, Darwin had arrived at the same conclusion nearly 20 years earlier, but Darwin was delaying the publication of his book, The Origin of Species, because he was trying to anticipate any conceivable objection to the theory. And, and one thing that perhaps should be um, cleared up here is that <clears throat> the real innovation of Darwin and Wallace was not the idea of evolution, because there was already fossil evidence for evolution. And many naturalists knew that, that there was such a thing as evolution. The, the, um, the, the discovery of uh, Wallace and Darwin was the mechanism behind evolution, or at the very least, the primary mechanism behind evolution. Because before Darwin and Wallace, there were many scientists who believed in evolution, but it was, it was um, less firmly believed because it was a bit too mysterious. People wondered why this would happen. Okay, um, arriving at this idea of natural selection was a very uh, powerful and actually in a way quite commonsensical explanation for evolution. Now, when Wallace had this idea of natural selection, he reported it as soon as possible. In fact, he reported it to Darwin. He didn't know that Darwin had had the idea, but he knew that Darwin was someone who knew a great deal about you know, biology and, and speciation, and that Darwin would be a good person to run this idea past. Um, when Wallace sent um, his Actually, he sent a manuscript to Darwin with a letter. Darwin wrote back saying that uh, he had had the same idea, and in fact had had the idea many years earlier. Now, um, a couple of short papers written both by Darwin and Wallace describing the concept were both presented during the same session of the Linnaean Society in an attempt to give credit to them both, although it was made very clear that Darwin was the one who had the idea first, and that Wallace independently had the same idea. 
later. If anything, Wallace's um, having the idea independently of Darwin was treated as corroboration of, um, of, of the plausibility of natural selection as explaining evolution. And the fact that uh, Wallace would eventually write a book with the title Darwinism shows that he was gracious about Darwin receiving the credit. Of course, Darwinism was the book by Wallace from which you read uh, the selection for today's, um, for today's lecture. And it wouldn't hurt, I suppose, to um, review what natural selection is. Let's, uh, let's dwell upon that for a little while. Um, here's how natural selection works. Uh, members of a species differ from one another. That's just an observation. You can see that that's true. And even offspring of the same parents will always differ to uh, some degree. Now, by reason of their differing, the members of a species will also differ in the death rates before having the chance to reproduce. Um, in nature, I mean, human beings are uh, perhaps a special case, but outside of, of humanity, um, there's never really enough food, at least not for very long. And so slight differences among members of a species will matter when it comes to receiving enough nutrition prior to reaching the age of reproductive maturity. So there will be differential death rates. Different subpopulations of a species will differ in their uh, pre-reproductive death rates. The population with the lowest death rate, or the subpopulation, I should say, the subpopulation with the lowest death rate is the best adapted subpopulation. Survival of the fittest actually means survival of the best adapted. It does not mean survival of the uh, whatever, survival of the meanest, or, or whatever it's popularly thought to mean. It just means survival of the best adapted. Because in the 19th century, the word fit uh, meant adapted. Fit meaning appropriate to one's environment. Uh, that is, uh, some traits are better adapted to the environment than are others, right? And the better adapted traits raise the chances of the organism living long enough to have offspring. Uh, so, the environment behaves something like a sieve. It favors some genomes over others. And the environment acts as a constant source of genomic change, resulting in the origin of new varieties and ultimately new species and even new genera. Now that was the innovation of Darwin and Wallace. It wasn't evolution per se, it was that uh, um, explanation of evolution. Now, eventually Darwin and uh, Wallace came to a disagreement. Wallace believed that natural selection is the only naturalistic factor in evolution. And by naturalistic, I mean the opposite of supernatural. Okay? Naturalistic meaning scientific. Um, it can be studied using reason and observation. For Wallace, the only naturalistic factor in evolution is natural selection. Now, Darwin, by contrast, was of the view that natural selection is just one factor among many. So uh, even though Darwin is very famous for this concept of natural selection, Darwin did not believe that natural selection is the only factor in evolution. Um, prior to Darwin, there was a scientist named uh, Lamarck who uh, tried to explain evolution in terms of two principles. One principle was a tendency toward greater and greater complexity, which no one really believes in anymore. Um, um, it's, it's very doubtful that there is such a principle. Uh, the other principle Lamarck believed in for explaining evolution, which um, is the one he's really famous for, is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So here's a, the famous illustration involves the giraffe. Okay, so you had a short-necked ancestor of the giraffe, something like an, an antelope, I suppose. And it would stretch its neck 
to reach the branches with uh, food on them. And it would, because it would stretch its neck, it would actually make its neck a little bit longer. Then its offspring would inherit the slightly longer neck. Not at birth, obviously, because they wouldn't have long necks when they're born, but th they would inherit this kind of structural propensity to develop a long neck in adulthood. And they would also stretch their necks to reach the good leaves. And as a result, their neck would be just a tad bit longer, and their offspring would inherit that acquired characteristic. And uh, Darwin uh, actually believed in this. I mean, he felt that Lamarck was correct about the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and that this was a factor in evolution in addition to natural selection. Wallace, by contrast, rejected this. For Wallace, natural selection is all you need to account for uh, any biological trait. And if you absolutely cannot explain something using natural selection, then you have to go outside science and appeal to something supernatural. Yeah. Um, now, uh, this Lamarckian idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, it has made something of a comeback recently in the field of, of epigenetics. Apparently, in, in some cases, there is something that looks a bit Lamarckian. Um, so, um, uh, for example, malnutrition uh, in, in childhood can result in a biological difference in one's grandchildren, as opposed to the grandchildren of people who did not have malnourished grandparents. So, so um, maybe Lamarck and Darwin were right about this, but... Um, Natural selection, obviously, is a huge factor in evolution. Now, Wallace, he tended to uh, view everything in evolution as the result of natural selection, and very ironically, this view eventually led Wallace to um, supernaturalism. And if he simply could find no way to explain a trait in terms of natural selection, then Wallace would conclude that God was responsible. And later in his life, Wallace became interested in uh, the supernatural, the occult, including seances. And here you see a photograph of Wallace with his mother. The funny thing about this photograph is that it was taken after Wallace's mother was dead. The woman in the photograph is not the dead body of Wallace's mother, but supposedly her uh, soul, I guess the ghost of Wallace's mother. This is one of those spirit graphs. Um, so yeah, Wallace really got into it. Um, Darwin and Wallace did both agree that natural selection could not explain all traits of an organism. But while Darwin appealed to multiple naturalistic factors, Wallace would appeal to the spiritual. In fact, Wallace's book Darwinism ends with the word spirit, with a capital S, in fact. Okay. So Wallace not only originated the theory of natural selection, he also originated intelligent design, or the theory of intelligent design. And <clears throat> it's in this context that Wallace argues against mathematics being a biological adaptation, and he continues by suggesting that it was God who gave human beings this ability for unbounded counting. Now, um, needless to say, the hypothesis that unbounded counting is an offshoot of language is much closer to Darwin's wholly naturalistic conception of evolution. I mean, when Chomsky, for example, suggests that uh, counting is a side product of language. There's nothing supernatural there at all. You know. But Wallace's case against unbounded counting being an adaptation is, so far as it goes, perfectly reasonable. His ultimate conclusion about spirituality or God or whatever, that may not be reasonable. But his more immediate conclusion against unbounded counting being uh, a biological adaptation is actually quite reasonable. And so that's what we're focusing on, the, the reasonable part.
Um, Wallace noted that among gatherer-hunter societies, the capacity for unbounded counting is not exercised. The reason I say gatherer-hunter instead of hunter-gatherer is uh, simply because um, in, in these communities, most of their calories, most of their food, is uh, acquired through gathering and, and not so much hunting. Right, so just, just to stress that, I say gather a hunter, as indeed many anthropologists do. It's not wrong to say it that way. Okay. All right, so Wallace noted that among many gather hunter societies, the capacity for unbounded counting is not exercised. And that's even a bit of an understatement because given recent psychological experiments, um, many gather hunters, especially in, in the Amazon, are, are simply not able to count with precision beyond four or maybe five. Um, I mean, even when it's very much in their uh, in interest to do so, even when they have an incentive. Um, so this is actually an accurate observation that Wallace is making. It is not Victorian Eurocentrism. Um, but you may wonder, how on earth could people get by uh, if they can't count beyond four or five with precision. Now this, th by the way, this is not to say that they cannot distinguish a really large amount of something from a smaller amount of something. They can do that. They can distinguish a large pile of something from a smaller pile of something. But that's different because that's not precise counting. That's not the use of integers. I mean, I'm talking about the use of integers here. Um, and you may wonder how they can get by that way. How is that possible? Um, the psychologist Steven Pinker has a nice discussion of how it works. Quoting here from Pinker's book, The Stuff of Thought, um, I used to be baffled by the prevalence of one too many counting systems among illiterate peoples until I asked the anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon who'd studied another Amazonian tribe, the Yanomama, how they get by. He said that, in, every, that in, in their everyday lives, the Yanomama don't need exact numbers because they keep track of things as individuals, one by one. A hunter, for example, recognizes each of his arrows and thereby knows whether one of them is missing without having to count them. It's the same habit of mind that would make most of us pause if someone asked us how many first cousins we have, or how many appliances are in our kitchen, or how many orifices in our orifices in our head. Now, uh, what's really striking, what's really remarkable about all of this, is that gatherer hunters represent the human mode of living for our ancestral environment. The human ancestral environment uh, was the living conditions of the Paleolithic. That is the conditions for which human beings evolved. Or you could also say Stone Age. There's a technical difference between Paleo Paleolithic and Stone Age. It's not, not really worth getting in here, getting into here. But uh, prior to 11,000 years ago, um, when we lived on the African savanna, or our ancestors did, those are the conditions for which we're adapted. And we evidently lived as gatherer hunters. So it's quite striking that the human beings today, who still live in a Paleolithic manner, that they are the ones who are least likely to have developed unbounded counting. And this strongly suggests that unbounded counting is not a Darwinian adaptation. If it's not being used in the ancestral environment, then it doesn't look like an adaptation. Um, and as you may recall, it was this sort of reasoning that led Hauser, and Chom Hauser Chomsky, and Fitch to infer tentatively that unbounded counting is an offshoot of language. Presumably language is an adaptation for something, 
even if the computational core of language is an adaptation for cognition rather than communication. Language is still an adaptation of some sort. And plausibly, our unbounded counting ability is an offshoot of, of language. In other words, it's a Franklin, to use the term that uh, Gould would use. Um, unbounded counting is a Franklin of something, and plausibly it's a Franklin of language, because both the integer series and language exhibit discrete infinity. Okay. Now, if this is true, you would think that disabling language or an impairment of syntax would be accompanied by uh, impairments with uh, counting. However, Rosemary Varley and her colleagues have uh, discovered cases in which arithmetic competence survives despite severe syntactic impairment. Now, does this refute the claim that counting is an offshoot of the language faculty? And just to kind of jump ahead and give the answer in advance, I wouldn't say that it refutes the claim, but I would say that it, it causes us to be a little bit more precise in what we mean by this claim. I mean, uh, the discovery of Varley et al. helps us or forces us to clarify what we mean when we say that unbounded counting is a result of language. Now, Varley and her colleagues tested uh, three men who were suffering from severe grammatical impairment, uh, resulting from large brain lesions in areas associated with language. In all three cases, there was damage to um, the same brain regions which are active both in language processing and also in arithmetical processing. So one might expect arithmetical incompetence even just for that reason alone. And also note that there are a number of language disorders which are accompanied by arithmetical incompetence. Nonetheless, uh, the scientists found that all basic arithmetical computational abilities remained intact despite the extreme syntactic impairment. Okay. So for example, um, the subjects were tested on bracket equations, such as the one, the one I've um, given here uh, near the top of the, the board. Um, solving this uh, problem requires very merge-like thinking. I mean, you don't solve this problem just by running through a series from left to right. You solve it by starting on the most subordinate level and working your way up. Right? You add 3 to 17, you get a result. You take that result and you multiply it by 3, and then you subtract that result from 90. So um, at each stage, you're working on two operands. I mean, you're working, you're working on two objects to get a result. And then you take that result and operate it with another operand and get a second result, and so on. It's very merge-like. It's very much like the derivation of a sentence, at least the theoretical derivation of a sentence, where you um, merge together objects starting from the bottom of the hierarchical structure and working your way up to the top. Okay, and uh, solving this problem requires the sort of sensitivity to structure, in other words, hierarchical structure, that we've encountered in uh, question formation, such as taking the following statement and turning it into a question. The statement being, the man who had killed the lion had hunted the bear. Now, in order to um, uh, transform that statement into a question, you have to be sensitive to um, the hierarchical structure of the sentence, as represented here by the brackets, or partly represented by the brackets. Likewise, in solving the above arithmetical problem, you have to be sensitive to the bracketing. If you change the bracketing around, you would change the problem, right? So uh, you would change the hierarchical structure. So the sentence 
just like the arithmetical um, formula at the top, is not just a series of words, it's a hierarchical structure. You transform it into a question by saying, had the man who killed the lion uh, hunted bear? You do not, in other words, you take the, uh, the most superordinate auxiliary verb. You do not go down to the subordinate level, so you do not say, killed the man who the lion had hunted the bear. That's not how you form a question. So, um, the, um, the subjects, these uh, three uh, people with the um, syntactic impairment, they could not parse a sentence like this. They would not be able to form a question from it. In fact, they would not even be able to understand it. And yet they could perform the arithmetical problem involving brackets. And uh, you see here... Uh, an actual experimental result involving the three subjects. Those are their initials, SA, SO, and PR. And uh, you see that they're, well, you see that they're working with bracket equations. Okay, so that illustrates, illustrates that point. Um, so what this means is that the subjects demonstrated a capacity for thinking in terms of hierarchical embedding in arithmetic even though their capacity for analogous thinking and sentence parsing was severely compromised. In fact, these subjects could not even understand the sentence, John hit Mary. And they could not distinguish the meaning of John hit Mary from Mary hit John. That's how severely syntactically incompetent these three people uh, were, or are, unfortunately. Um, and yet, they are capable of executing something merge-like in arithmetic, despite having severe difficulties doing so in language. Patients were also tested for their comprehension of infinity in arithmetic, which is what you see illustrated here. Um, their performance here clearly shows recursive ability. So, you first have to write a number that's bigger than one, that's smaller than two, and the subject here wrote 1.5, which is a nice, I guess that's the most obvious answer. Now you have to make the number bigger, but still less than two, 1.6, and do that again, 1.7. <laughs> and you can see that the idea here is the, the infinite divisibility between you know, um, one and two. And um, the subject is, um, generating a series that's potentially infinite and showing uh, good awareness of its potential infinity, even um, using an arrow to indicate that. And recall that one thing that Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch believe uh, can be explained, uh, one mathematical thing which can be explained by appealing to language is infinity. Our arithmetical capacity is potentially infinite because the language faculty is potentially infinite. Now, reflecting on the uh, experiment reported by Varley et al., the psychologist Elizabeth Brannon remarks that these results argue against a proposal made by Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch that the mathematical principle of recursive infinity is derived from the recursive property of natural languages. Varley et al.'s current findings instead suggest that even though language and mathematics both share the principle of computational recursion, their syntaxes are anatomically distinct and therefore quite independent. Now, uh, this result has been criticized. Uh, the linguist Luigi Rizzi suggested that the experiment does not adequately control for the distinction between performance versus competence. Um, what he's suggesting, in other words, what Rizzi is suggesting, is that these three subjects are still capable of merge. They're still executing the merge operation, but it's, it is not manifest externally because of a breakdown in a performance system. 
So the inability to parse a sentence, even as simple as Mary hit John, may reflect a breakdown in a performance system as opposed to a breakdown in merge itself. The merge operation uh, would then still be available for other things, such as arithmetic. Now, um, Ritchie's suggestion is consistent with the fact that there are language disorders which co-occur with arithmetical incompetence. So um, the three subjects here may have an unusual sort of language disorder, which only affects a performance system. Now, I don't think... Now, I mean, it's conceivable that this is true. However, I don't think that it really is the best objection to um, Varley et al. In fact, I'm not sure that Varley et al. really need to be confronted with an objection because their own discussion of these results is quite reasonable in my view. But when it comes to this distinction between competence and performance, I want you to note that Varley and her co-authors did rule out at least one classic performance impairment. Namely, they ruled out impairment to short-term phonological memory. And here is a quote from the um, article that you read by Varley et al. Failures on grammatical tasks could not be attributed to reduced short-term phonological memory because all the patients displayed large enough spans to process the sentence structures tested in the reversible sentences and grammatic healthy judgments tests. The reversible sentences are sentences like Mary hit John, which reverses as John hit Mary. Yeah. Um, so they were tested uh, at least for uh, phonological working memory. Now, um, Technically, there's a distinction between producing a sentence versus parsing a sentence. Um, one produces a sentence when one creates that sentence in one's mind. And one parses a sentence by recognizing the structure of the sentence when it is produced by someone else. So, if you are saying, the boy saw the man on the hill with the telescope, then you're producing the sentence. If you hear me say it, and, and you grasp the structure of the sentence, which of course you would, then you are parsing the sentence. Okay? So there's a distinction there. However, on the simplest account, the same recursive operation, the same merge operation, underlies both production and parsing. Why? Well, because otherwise it would be too complicated. It's not plausible that there are two computational systems running in parallel and always yielding the same results. It's not plausible that you have a production system giving you a parsing tree, like the one you see here. Of course, that's not a full parsing tree, but whatever. Uh, it's kind of a schematic parsing tree. It's not plausible that you have a um, recursive procedure for producing such a tree when you're speaking or writing or thinking. And then you have another recursive procedure which generates the same tree for someone who's listening or reading. The simplest assumption is that there's one recursive procedure that is entering into both production and parsing. Okay. Um, now, what does this have to do with performance versus competence? Well, um, there are impairments in which the person has trouble parsing, but they can still produce. And there are impairments where the person has trouble producing, but they can still parse. And plausibly, those are performance impairments because the merge operation is still working in both cases. If you can produce a sentence but not parse it, you're still 
producing a tree-like structure in your mind. That tree-like structure is still forming in your mind. Okay. So if there's an impairment there, it must be a performance impairment, not a problem with competence, not a problem with merge, not a problem with computation itself. And likewise, if you have trouble producing but you can still parse, that must be a performance impairment, not, a, not an impairment with merge itself, not an impairment with competence. No. Um, the the uh, three subjects in the study performed by Varley and her colleagues, they exhibited both impairments. Their production was impaired and their parsing was impaired, which is consistent with the uh, computational core of language itself being disabled. Okay. All right, so uh, it, it's reasonable to say that probably merge itself has been disabled in these three these three men with the syntactic difficulty with the syntactic impairment it doesn't really look like a performance problem it looks like a competence problem in other words the recursive procedure itself has been disabled and yet they're still able to perform arithmetical calculations even very um, I mean even calculations that require uh, merge like processing Nonetheless, it's still conceivable that there is some other performance system which has been impaired in these subjects. Yes, it is conceivable. It's conceivable that merge is still running in there and somehow uh, the communication system, the faculty of language in the broad sense, simply can't access it. Um, but Here's the problem. If one distinguishes competence from performance so liberally, so easily, then how is one supposed to test for the reliance of, of arithmetical ability upon language? It seems like almost any test you could come up with, someone could object to it by saying, oh, well, it was just a performance that was disabled and, and the merge operation is still working in there. And we've encountered this sort of problem before. The distinction between competence and performance sometimes makes psychological testing very difficult. When one notices, for example, that dolphin social recursion only exhibits two embeddings at most, or at least so far only two embeddings have been observed. Now, does this mean that dolphin social recursion is not potentially infinite? so that it does not exhibit discrete infinity, it, it's finite? Or does it mean that dolphin social recursion um, has a performance limitation, such as a channel capacity? Well, that's a really hard question to answer, and that's, that's why it, it's hard to say whether other species have mental recursion or not. It seems like an, like an empirical question, but it's devilishly hard to find like, convincing ways to, uh, to answer it. Now, the philosopher of cognition, Margaret Bowden, has uh, criticized the making of the distinction between competence and performance, and it's for this sort of reason that she has criticized the distinction. According to Bowden, making the competence-performance distinction historically like back in the 60s, is, is when it, well, actually back in the 50s with Miller, but then Chomsky applied that distinction to language. Um, it put a theoretical firewall between the psychology of language and linguistics, according to Bowden. And as a result, it instructed linguists to take no heed of psychology. And so she claims that making the competence-performance distinction has rendered linguistics non-empirical. And Bowden would probably even say, that's why syntactic theory is so abstract. It's highly abstract because it's not even empirical. Okay. Um, that made Chomsky angry, by the way. But anyway. Um, so applying this to uh, you know, Rizzi and Varley and, and, and so forth, 
Uh, for Bowdoin, it's simply too easy to dismiss psychological results. In fact, she could even use Rizzi as an illustration. He, Rizzi dismissed the psychological results of Varley et al. too quickly, too simply, too easily, because of this distinction between competence and performance. On the other hand, the distinction between competence and performance is a very elementary distinction, and it's difficult to deny. Um, I mean, as I noted before in an earlier lecture, even mortality is a performance limitation. The fact that each of us dies after a finite span of time means that we will only ever parse or produce a finite number of sentences. Um, and yet, that's an arbitrary constraint to place upon language. I mean, we know that language is potentially infinite. Furthermore, performance limitations can be scientifically studied, as Miller and, and Dunbar have shown in their work on channel capacities. I mean, Dunbar's work on, well, his anthropological work involving the size of the neocortex and the size of social groups is obviously empirical. And its work focused on performance. In this case, competence being social intelligence and performance being the processing of, of that social intelligence and the, and the behavioral execution of that social intelligence. As you recall from reading the selection from George Miller's book, I mean, Miller describes psychological experiments that involve testing channel capacities in linguistics, in sentence comprehension. So there are experimental ways of teasing performance and competence apart. But it is also true that just when you think you've tested something, someone can always make an objection saying, oh no, that's really just competence versus performance. And then you think that, oh, well, maybe, you know, we haven't really tested it after all. Um, it does not look to me like a competence performance. Uh, it does not look to me like the distinction between competence and performance is really relevant here. It, this does not look like a performance disorder in which competence remains intact. Because Varley and her colleagues, they, they investigated that. They looked into that, as, as I already noted a little while ago. It's conceivable that Ritzi has a point, but uh, I'm, I'm rather dubious. It doesn't really look like that's what's going on. However, you will be delighted to learn that um, Varley et al., of course you already know this because you read their article, but Varley et al. do not deny that unbounded counting may be an offshoot of natural language. Their result, in fact, does not force us to abandon the claim that unbounded counting is derived from natural language, but it does force us to be a little bit more specific as to what that means. Here's a selection from their article, which should sound familiar. And at the end of their paper in the discussion section, they comment that language grammar might provide a bootstrapping template to facilitate the use of other hierarchical and generative systems, such as mathematics. However, once these resources are in place, mathematics can be sustained without the grammatical and lexical resources of the language faculty. In other words, general intelligence learns recursion from the language faculty. General intelligence acquires the ability to uh, produce nested structures from the language faculties doing so. Once this has been learned, once general intelligence has acquired this ability, then it's possible for the language faculty to be damaged, even the narrow language faculty, the computational core of language to be damaged, and for general intelligence to continue uh, uh, exercising recursion. That's one proposal that they make, which I find pretty reasonable. Um, now, uh, one of the men, uh, as Varley et al. note, uh, one of the uh, subjects in their experiment had advanced competence in mathematics prior to his brain damage 
so you see, um, he was able to build up a mathematical ability to a very large degree independently of language. So according to this hypothesis, which strikes me as the most reasonable one, language is a bit like a ladder that one climbs to the top. And once one reaches the top, one can simply kick away the ladder. One doesn't need it anymore. This may remind you of a metaphor from Wittgenstein. Um, if you're not familiar with the metaphor, that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not that important. Uh, but the metaphor itself uh, does seem to apply here. Uh, language, well, there are different hypotheses, but the one that strikes me as the most reasonable here is that language is like a ladder that general intelligence can use to acquire recursive ability. Then it's possible for language to be severely damaged and general intelligence still has that ability. Right? Whereas if the organism had not had the language faculty in the first place, then there, uh, there would have been no unbounded counting. Okay. Okay. Um, now, that unbounded counting somehow depends upon the language faculty was later established by Elizabeth Spipen and her colleagues, as you remember, we discussed them a, a few lectures ago. If one grows up monolingually with a language lacking number words, one will not distinguish precise quantities beyond some very low number, such as four. And the Munduruku illustrate this, the Amazonian Munduruku, because they don't have uh, any uh, uh, number word greater than five and they have difficulties counting past five. And also home signers, as you'll recall, home signers um, developed their own sign languages spontaneously, which is actually good evidence that language structure is largely biologically innate, that it can emerge spontaneously, even in the absence of contact with a, uh, an ambient language community. But apart from that, uh, in these languages, one does not find uh, number words. Okay? Uh, so number words do not emerge spontaneously. And home signers in psychological experiments show great difficulty recognizing precise quantities beyond roughly four. Okay? Um, all right, okay, so... Um, Another question is um, another question for Rizzi, and one reason why I'm skeptical of, of Rizzi's position is that one wants to know which cognitive performance system has been damaged in these three men. I mean, which cognitive performance system would impair language without hurting mathematical ability? If working memory, for example, is impaired, then you would expect that to hurt both abilities unless language and general intelligence have separate working memory systems, which seems unlikely. I mean, it's conceivable, but it's simpler if there's just one. And as Pinker has pointed out, counting with precision beyond a very small number requires a counting routine, in other words, an algorithm. The recursive component of language makes such a routine possible. However, merely knowing a language does not guarantee that one will also know such a routine. It's something that has to be taught. So the algorithm, the routine, the formula for counting has to be taught. But plausibly, the uh, recursion which is utilized in that algorithm results from the computational core of language. Now, the point made by a pinker about a routine or an algorithm is very close to the point made by Wallace when he notes that even among the ancient Greeks and Romans, mathematics failed to develop very far. Why? Well, because their routines for calculation were not convenient. They were cumbrous, as Wallace puts it. Because imagine doing long division with Roman numerals. Um, it would be it would be a pain. <laughs> I'm sure there are people who did it, but it would really be a pain. And um, so 
Ancient Mediterranean mathematics did not develop terribly far, except in geometry. <clears throat> in other words, arithmetical ability is very much like literacy. Literacy requires language. You don't have literacy without language. However, language just by itself does not guarantee literacy. Literacy also requires a system of writing, just as counting requires a counting routine. Now, but if that's the case, why is it so difficult to teach unbounded counting to species that already show evidence of recursive cognition, such as baboons? Um, in personal correspondence, Varley has suggested that there is no language-specific recursive mechanism. Uh, in other words, there is no FLN, there is no narrow language faculty. But rather, there is a domain general recursive mechanism. And its function is first observed in language. But it can also be expressed in other information domains, such as number or general reasoning. Now, that's different from the bootstrapping template hypothesis. So, I suspect that the, uh, the passage about the bootstrapping template was written by one of Varley's co-authors. Varley herself seems to believe in something like the language of thought hypothesis. Because what she just expressed in that quote is very much like the language of thought. Um, the language of thought hypothesis is, namely, that recursion is generally a feature of thought, or a feature of a very wide range of different types of cognition. And recursions being disabled in one application does not necessarily mean that it is disabled in some other application. The psychologist Michael Corbalis argues that recursive cognition is unique to humans, but it's not unique to the language faculty. So in other words, recursion is domain general, so Corbalis does not believe in a narrow language faculty. Recursion is domain general, but nonetheless it's unique to humans. And this is a kind of language of thought hypothesis, but with the qualification that only human beings have a language of thought, because only humans think recursively. You see, on the standard or classic language of thought hypothesis, as you would find in Jerry Fodor's book, The Language of Thought, now, the language of thought is shared with other species, so chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans and probably giraffes and elephants and porpoises and so forth. They all have the language of thought. What's unique with humans is simply that we externalize the language of thought. We, we've um, we've um, specialized it. Well, we also use it in a communication system, right? whereas other species don't. Other species only use language for thinking. And uh, uh, if it's true that the language of thought is only had by human beings, which is what Corbalis is suggesting, if that's true, it would explain why one can continue to display arithmetical competence even after losing language ability. While other species, even after extensive training, are not capable of unbounded counting. Um, nonetheless, there's some sort of connection between language vocabulary, in other words, lexical items. There's some sort of connection between lexical items and counting. And this is shown in the evidence adduced by Spipe and et al. Because without the right vocabulary, you're not going to be able to... Uh, to count, evidently, or without growing up with the right vocabulary. Now, oh, let's see, I have some material here on endocentricity. I don't think that there's really time to get into it for this lecture. In a subsequent lecture, there may be uh, some time to get around to it. Um, hmm. Okay, then. Um, all right. For the next lecture, prior to the next lecture, I would like for you to read the article by uh, Gerald Katz called The Unfinished Chomskyan Revolution.
And let me give you a little, um, a little, a little bit of anticipation as to what Katz is talking about. Um, according to Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch, language is biological. I believe they even use the term biolinguistics in their um, article, in their 2002 article, biolinguistics. So these sentence trees that we see are supposed to be in the brain somehow. In some manner, they're, they're realized in the brain, according to Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. Recursion occurs in the brain. Now, um, language is supposed to exhibit discrete infinity, which means, one thing that it means, is that the number of parsing trees for a language is infinite. Now, language is supposed to be neural tissue. It's supposed to be something in the brain. The brain is finite. It's finite along every dimension, including time. So, if language exhibits discrete infinity, then language is not in the brain, according to Katz, and also according to Postal. According to Katz, it's confused to speak of biolinguistics, because languages must be abstract. They must be, be what are known as platonic forms. In other words, in contrast to a brain process or a brain state, uh, or something coded in neural tissue. Language must be what is known as an abstract object, meaning that it has no location in space or in time. In fact, it's plausible that the entire universe is finite along every dimension. So language cannot be contained in the universe. Language must occupy some domain or realm in which abstract objects are located abstract objects such as numbers. Okay. So according to Katz, sentences are like numbers. They're abstract. The mind does not produce them. The mind grasps them. The empirical biological mind stands in some sort of epistemic relation known as grasping. It stands in the grasping relation to these abstract objects. And that's how we understand sentences. So Katz is what is known, or he, or he was what is known, as a linguistic Platonist. Katz passed away, so it has to be past tense. Katz um, was what is known as a linguistic Platonist. And this also relates to social cognition because the uh, relational models also exhibit discrete infinity due to compounding, due to the presence of adjunction and recursion, one also finds discrete infinity among the relational models. So does that mean that the relational models are also abstract objects and they're not in the brain? Well, okay, I think that's potentially an interesting question. That's the sort of question that Katz raises, although Katz is only talking about language He's not talking about uh, relational models per se, but the applicability of his point to relational models is clear enough. Um, so I would like for you to read that for the le next lecture. Any questions, please email me and let me know, and I'll see you. Bye.